Um, I started with uh, Paul in 2002 uh, with a few other colleagues like Merdad and, and Ian and Philippe. We were a small group that decided to go on this mission along with Paul and we haven't seemed to, to shake ourselves free. Um, so over, over time, <laughs> over time, um, uh, I've, I've taken on responsibility for informatic support uh, for this initiative. Um, and uh, what uh, me and my team focus on is core, core informatics tools. And I use the term core informatics because um, there are lots of informatics tools that target very specific problems, but core informatics tools have to target shared problems across uh, a community. And so that's what uh, these two platforms actually do. Um, Bold has been around for uh, quite some time, since 2004. It was announced officially in 2005 at the first International Barcode of Life conference in, in the UK. Um, and through its life, it's seen uh, different data rates. It's an informatics platform. Data rates are really important uh, to informatics platforms. And I see it in, in sort of three stages thus far, pre-eyeball, um, eyeball phase one. And in the last three years, we've, we've been in a cool down process uh, to allow for technology development. And again, from an informatics point of view, the rates are important. The rates are important because we're not just uh, collecting data records. We have to cleanse them. We have to curate them. And we have to ensure that they maintain a particular level of integrity uh, and fitness for use. So these data rates need to be carefully monitored. And in, uh, at the launch of Eyeball, uh, there was this big shift in, in the rate that we had to deal with. And Ball had to adapt uh, to meet that, meet that requirement. Um, now Paul has asked for another big shift. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is it's not as stark a shift as we originally made at the start of Eyeball, just in terms of the, the delta in slope. But we once again have to change our approach and uh, bring new tools to the uh, uh, to the table. So this is where the addition of Embrave comes in. So these two platforms will actually work together. Um, Embrave is just just about to get to uh, its first first birthday, um, but uh, already it's it's starting to get use here uh, and in a few other places. Um, and from the outside, when people look at these two platforms, uh, there seems to be this uh, classification that bold is for uh, first generation uh, sequencing data, and Embrave is for second and third generation sequencing data. But I want to say that that's, that's not quite how these systems are in, intended. They actually uh, are part of the same solution for constructing reference data. Uh, Embrave needed to be there to act as a big data funnel so that we could deal with the volume of data and pipe it in in a streamlined fashion into uh, building these reference libraries. So I'm just going to go through a quick refresher on Bold and, and tell you about some of the new features that we have in the latest version of Bold um, before getting to, uh, to Embrave. And um, so Bold had four roles. Uh, it had to maintain and enforce the uh, data standards, uh, act as a central database for the community. We want all the data in one place so they can be indexed and searched and discovered as needed. Um, and also to provide an environment for secure collaboration. This is an international project. Biodiversity does not respect national borders. So we needed a way to share information and smash records together and both provides that. And because you have an environment where people have data, it's now very common to have analytical tools integrated with that data. You keep the computing close to where the data lives uh, so that you can, uh, uh, you can process things quickly. Um, as far as I know, Bolt still remains the most prominent database that uh, has a dichotomous record for biodiversity data. So um, on the left, we have a washed out specimen record. Um, and uh, it's extended, the, uh, the schema has been extended over time uh, with images and uh, additional characteristics of specimens. Uh, 
And on the right, we have a sequence record, which over time has supported multiple markers and holds all the ancillary information uh, uh, around the sequence that's generated. Um, I will say the sequences are focused, the sequence storage is focused on marker gene sequencing. It is a very focused platform. It's not a genomics platform. So it's in stark contrast to uh, some of the other solutions that are out there. Bold helps people manage this data. Uh, all data requires management, versioning, um, and uh, discussion. So it has a range of management portals and interfaces. Uh, over here, we've got a project console allowing you to establish a project management framework. Uh, you can access individual records. Uh, two records are uh, the specimen and sequence record over there. Um, recently, with Bold 4, we introduced a checklist database so that you could uh, maintain national and thematic checklists and have it automatically generate the reports based on uh, the data that's in, in Bold. The database itself follows a layered data schema. Um, and this layered schema allows us to expand over time. So our primary data, our primary data started with a single marker gene, CO1, um, or MACK and RBCL for, uh, for plants, and then we added secondary data and lots of metadata. With BOLD4, we added domain-specific extensions and application-specific extensions. So uh, let me get to what that means in a moment. But first, in terms of secondary data, here's a perfect example of secondary data. Uh, these are all the different gene markers that are on, on BOLD right now. There are 126 others besides the marker genes. It's this long tail distribution, as one would expect. And this is a, a log scale. So we see CO1 obviously being being the most prominent, followed by MACK, KRBC on ITS, the plant, uh, the plant barcodes. But these 126 others are equally welcome, and they serve to support those, those barcode markers. And uh, I believe the largest combination of markers for a single specimen record I've seen is uh, about 28, but uh, we haven't really set a limit. So uh, it's very easy to store, for example, mitochondrial genomes as long as you pull out uh, the specific uh, genes uh, that are in there and still keep it specimen-centric. So that's, that's really key about this. And uh, we can store fairly long markers. So the largest block that we can store for an individual marker is 10 KB, which will cover uh, I would say 98% of, 99% of the genes that, that you'll find uh, out there. Now, going back to the extensions, this is a very, uh, I think this, this slide has been seen by lots of different people. It's the workflow and data model for, for BOLD, where we've got the components of a specimen record and the components of a, a DNA sequence record. But with BOLD 4, we added, uh, uh, for in this case, uh, the application extension, so we can store things like mass, chemical properties, isotopes, uh, ecological information, uh, morphological information, and more. In fact, Bold is set up so that you can, as a community, go in and define those for a set of projects, and then the whole group, a national network, a thematic network, can start to add that. Essentially, define fields without any involvement of me and, uh, and my team. In terms of analytical functionality, um, this is really important to us uh, for two things, uh, for two reasons. Um, one is for data validation. Uh, when you can, after you've immediately uploaded your data, when you can push a few buttons and validate that data with trees, with maps, uh, with uh, image uh, libraries, it's really powerful for ensuring the correctness of this data because we know mistakes are made and errors uh, creep into databases. But we've also started adding other analytical functionality that's become commonplace in the biodiversity informatics community, things like alpha and beta diversity measures um, and geographic uh, uh, distance versus uh, correlation between geographic distance and uh, genetic distance. Um, and importantly, uh, because we've been talking about bins, with Bold 4, we opened up the Russell algorithm, the algorithm that lies underneath the bin uh, framework. So on a, on a data set of up to 100,000, 
you can run Russell uh, on it yourself and preemptively get the list of OTUs that Russell would produce or putative bins before they're actually accepted into the system. In addition, we have a uh, historical view to the database because it's a dynamic database. It's a curatorial database as well. So things change. Um, so every record is actually a time layered uh, set of records. So here's a perfect example of uh, a geometrid, uh, not a pretty geometrid, but still a geometrid. Uh, before, before the lepidopterists uh, hop on this, 2013, it was uploaded to Bolt. So this is a view on Bolt. Uh, someone came along in 2015 and put Paul as the identifier from Biodiversity Institute of Ontario. Um, I, I'm, I hope he didn't identify it from the specimen, but maybe it's an easy one. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and then later on in, uh, in that year, or shortly after, um, the name was changed um, uh, with the epithet moving to a different genus. But we can see this, these changes in time, which is becoming more and more important as the volume of data increases. So going back to those data rates, we need these kinds of tools so that we can all act as a, as a group on this data. So, um, let me just mention a little bit about my plans for Bold 4.5 based on uh, conversations with people in this, uh, this room, people in different places, about what, what is needed to move things into eyeball phase two. One, um, we need to be able to deal with even larger blocks of, of data. Um, if we're talking about 2.5 million species, Bold needs to scale uh, much higher. We need improved annotation workflows so that we can crowdsource things, we can, uh, uh, we can add annotation layers above the original records, and we also need reliable high-level uh, uh, high taxonomic identification, specifically at the family and order level. We don't want to have to look at these, these specimens all the time. We want the computer to do the work for us. Um, and last, but I would argue probably the most important, is we need to quickly adapt or adopt some new data standards for the new technologies that are uh, in play in eyeball uh, phase two. Um, so in terms of dealing with data at larger scales, Bold went through the various order of magnitude shifts in the data blocks that you could deal with from 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 4 um, with Bold 4. Um, and the malaise traps really drove us to do that. So you can create data sets of up to 99,999 uh, records. But with eyeball phase two moving forward, we need, that actually says 10 to the five, but it's washed out. Because what we're going to be getting into is site-based barcode generation, where we're not dealing with one trap, we're dealing with lots of traps in a given location, and that's Algonquin Park about four hours north of here. The other thing we need to do is be able to annotate, and this is a, a, a tool that's already been developed and will be rolled out for uh, broad use that leverages the millions of images that we have to extract information, extract features through an annotation process. The so first thing we've done here is use a scale bar um, and then annotated the images so that we have a sense of the scale that this lives at. Um, uh, almost every organism lives across a spectrum of 13 orders of magnitude. It would be really good to know what the order of magnitude is for every single bin that we have. Again, um, having to streamline large volumes of data. So here, uh, this, is, this is developed uh, as part of the Actius project with Rudolf Rougeri. Uh, and in addition, what we're doing is extracting traits like eye spots and uh, tail lengths and body, uh, body lengths as well as antenna lengths. But this can be used to extract information from this massive image resource. In addition, um, we plan to use this as, as a crowdsourcing platform to get students and others that we don't have to pay for um, to, uh, to annotate these, these images. Um, uh, and hopefully, once we have sufficiently large number that are annotated, we can bring in some artificial intelligence through neural networks to start extracting this information automatically. But what's required is training data to be able to do this. Um, in terms of 
higher taxonomic classification. What we need to do is we need to decouple the feature extraction process from the identification. Today, we see it as one process. You throw in a sequence for glass, you get a name back, and you accept the top hit um, or the, uh, the second top hit. But what we need is to start to separate that process. The alignment is just one feature set that's being extracted. But we need an independent process to classify to both species and higher level uh, uh, taxonomy. And I'll give you an, an example of what features uh, we have, because we do have lots in just the DNA barcode. It is, the nice thing about DNA is high dimensional. So we can look at the amino acid composition. So this is uh, nine, is it nine? Yeah, nine of the largest orders of insects. And just a vector of the amino acid compositions uh, with the principal component analysis. And we can see uh, diptera easily separate out. Lepidoptera, there's a clump of lepidoptera. Uh, there is coleoptera there. Uh, Hemiptera is a little bit more spread out with smaller points over there. But then when we come to the Kamers, we find that Hemiptera starts to collapse in. So we can select features that do best for each group. And uh, modern classification methods will work really well on that. And we've we started working with um, some colleagues in, in Finland um, to do exactly that with uh, a method called Protax that's already uh, quite popular. Um, it's based on Bayesian multinomial regression. Um, but it's designed so that it accepts a lot of features, including taxonomic checklists, and builds on pre-existing uh, classifiers like BLAST or, or identification systems or the bold identification engine. So at the end of the day, this is going to be more powerful than any of the individual pieces uh, uh, together. And lastly, for Bolt 4.5 data standards, um, the four elements of the data standard that we set in 2015, uh, sorry, 2005 at Front Royal, um, were quality, completeness of the record, the locus, and provenance data. Um, and when we look at the application of next generation sequencing um, and, and where data sits today, qual completeness is not a problem. Everyone's come on board to the elements that are required for a data barcode, uh, for a DNA barcode. Locus, I think any debates about locus are still, uh, still there, but they're, they're at the fringes. You know, generally, people uh, uh, plan on having the standard barcode. What we don't have a handle on anymore is quality. NGS complicates things. You have different vendors. We lived in a, in a comfortable world of a single vendor of life technologies producing a single instrument that uh, produced most of the barcodes up to date. But um, now we've got lots of NGS vendors that we need to deal with. Um, and then provenance. So uh, barcodes generated with uh, NGS sequences are already being uh, uploaded to, to Bold, but they lack provenance completely. So we do need to start to set these standards and then make sure that we train uh, the community on them. So uh, in terms of provenance, uh, one of the key elements of, of the provenance was, was a trace file. Demonstrated that this was a real process that produced uh, uh, through an instrument and, and created something. We could very easily take all the sequences that produced a consensus sequence for a DNA barcode and that, that takes its place. So these are not difficult problems to address. We just have to go through and agree upon what those standards are and what the criteria are um, before uh, moving forward. So um, that's bold 4.5. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, if I have a good amount of time, 12 minutes, on, uh, on Embrake. Now I will say that with bold 4.5, we have to dispel the idea of this being a Sanger database. With eyeball phase two, um, the amount of data that's generated with uh, third generation sequencing will overshadow everything that we've generated to this date. So it will become an NGS database as well, um, except uh, it will depend on Embrave to do heavy lifting on the NGS data there. So we've addressed this, this linkage. In fact, they share a single sign-on. So if you have an account on Bold, you have an account, the same account on Embrave with the same password, and, and vice versa. And so uh, I'll explain how they work together to solve the problems that we have. But first, let me touch on the, 
the um, motivation for, for Embrave. Um, it's around the, the big data problems that, that we see with NGS data processing. It's very easy today with uh, off-the-shelf tools to deal with one, five, 10, 15 next generation sequencing runs. But when you're talking about hundreds, it becomes a serious problem. Um, and in the, in the data science community, we call it, or the big data community, we call it drinking from the fire hose. Um, I hope no one here has tried to drink from a hot fire hose. Uh, I haven't tried, but I imagine it's quite, quite difficult. And here's a, a perfect example of the, the symptoms of this. Metabarcoding papers have been growing quite, uh, quite aggressively. And so this is not a cumulative graph. This is the production each year. In 2018, already we've exceeded uh, the number of papers uh, in 2017. But yet, when you look at where the data lies, generally, DNA sequences end up in GenBank or, uh, or uh, uh, ENA or DDBJ. But when we looked at the top papers that show up in Google Scholar, we had a hard time. In 2013, sure, 2013 is forgivable. Seven out of the 10 papers, we could not find the data that was associated with that manuscript. Got better in 2015, but in 2017, it got worse again. So um, we need to start to address this. In addition, um, the data ends up in a lot of different places. So it's hard to search and mine the data. Uh, for reuse, and it's really important to be able to reuse this data. It's expensive to generate. So Embrave's focus really is storage analysis, indexing, discovery, and standards. So having this platform, uh, it may be a tall order, but this is, uh, this is what we're trying to do. That's two modes of operation. Uh, it supports traditional metabarcoding, uh, and uh, recently we added multiplexed barcoding. And it follows the same philosophies of both low levels of training, you need very little training to be able to use them, um, and uh, very graphical uh, and interactive uh, systems. We're trying very hard to move Embrave towards being uh, platform agnostic, because we know it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the future of next generation sequencing. I know in 2005, when we sat around a table and developed the, the standards, we assumed Sanger sequencing would be used for 20, 30 years ahead, clearly we were, uh, we were wrong. Um, so uh, right now, we've got great support for PacBio. We've got very good support for, um, uh, for uh, the uh, ion torrent group of instruments. We have pretty good support for MySeq. We still don't have um, a paired end merging, but it's something that we'll add. We have even less support for MinION. And it may seem like a trivial thing, but each one of these instruments has its own idiosyncrasies with biases, very different error rates, uh, which I won't get into, but they all need to be accommodated because this data is going to a single platform. We want to be able to compare apples to apples, and that requires converting oranges to apples. So that's something we're going to try to do. Uploading data into, uh, into Embrave, very easy. We do have a minimum set of data fields that, that we want, um, but it's designed specifically to accept very large files and to stream them. So we want, uh, right now, the, the minimum data that we want is the collection dates and the location where it was collected as well as uh, sample information. But once you have it, you can see that bar is going. It's uploading while filling out the next, the information for the next run. So you can queue up a whole bunch of runs and have it stream the data in. It's also right with the recognition that you're moving very large files around on the internet. So it has to be resilient to network connectivity issues. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth talk to confirm that data packets are received. If one fails, it'll retry it. It'll also adjust the bandwidth used based on the detected bandwidth of, uh, uh, of the, the user because this is for an international community and bandwidth does vary across the world. So um, once you have your data in bold, once you, once you upload it, it follows a, a very typical pipeline. Um, so there is the uh, metabarcoding uh, pipeline and that's, that's filtering, dereplication, pre-clustering and denoising, identification, uh, OTU generation, um, and uh, then you can download your results. And most importantly, this data stays there. 
It's not your pipeline where it just disappears. So it stays there so you can adjust your parameters later on. The demultiplexing process, this is where you've got metabarcoding, um, does your demultiplexing based on the tags that are uploaded, does your contig assembly. Right now you can, uh, it's possible to download your generated sequences, but what we want to have is a direct upload to Bolt because it's the same account. Wouldn't it be nice if you use bold sample IDs or process IDs and the data just flowed into Bolt so that you can start to uh, analyze it? It's a highly visual system, which you can't really see from uh, the level of light. Um, now, it's, it's designed to be highly visual because when you're dealing with large amounts of data, most people treat the pipelines that, that analyze them as black boxes. And the danger of black boxes is you just trust the result without seeing any of the, uh, the characteristics as it goes through uh, the pipeline. So we've got visualizations that show status in real time as it's going through. I'll give you one example. Uh, this is the QV distribution. So there's just straight QV, QV10, QV20, the GC distribution, and the length distribution. And the different colors here show how the distribution shifts based on your filtering parameters, uh, post-dereplication, and then denoising and pre-clustering. Because if you don't know how it's changing the distribution, you're not really sure uh, of the impact of your, uh, your parameters. And in some cases, you have to watch what it does to the GC composition. Two minutes, eh? Mm. OK, then I'll start to rush. Um, configuring the pipeline is very easy. We've got a series of sliders, and um, there are three, three groups of parameters trimming, filtering, and uh, identification, or two parameters. Um, one thing that's very unique about this platform is the way it deals with reference libraries. It uses Bold for its reference libraries, but it also allows you to set multiple reference libraries and build your own custom reference libraries. Every data set in Bold is a reference library that you can choose. The way this works is you have a bunch of these reads, and if you have three reference libraries, all the sequences pass through the first reference library, and they get, they get ID. Whatever's left goes through the second and third, and then goes through O2 generation. This has the knock-on effect of speeding up the process and lowering the computational cost. Because your choice of first reference library is always going to be the highest quality reference library, which is obviously going to be in, uh, in, in short supply for quite some time. Um, I'll skip over the example of using screening. With multiplex barcoding, um, Again, washed out, but you essentially upload a FASTA file of uh, your forward tags, your reverse tags, and register them. And then once you've got your plates mapped, you just upload another, very much like a bold uh, specimen spreadsheet with uh, the mappings to the labels. And the system will go through, analyze it, and pull out information for each one of these. So there's, there's a process ID, 52 reads, one config produced, but also gives you lots of information about the confidence of the assignment. Here's how much overlap you had with the five prime barcode. Here's how much you had with the three prime barcode. It supports dual indexing and single indexing. What's more, when you have cases, and we do have cases of this, of multiple contigs introduced, say bacterial endosymbionts or contamination, the download process allows you to filter that out based on match, uh, match distances, uh, number of reads that are associated with the contig. So it makes it very easy to deal with this volume of data. The data organization, I'll rush through this, is very similar to Bold, where um, you have projects and you have runs underneath that, um, and you have analytical tools as well. You can do comparative analytics right in there. And here I selected multiple runs from three different sites and just looked at the beta diversity. It's just a few clicks to uh, get this result. It's not intended for going to publication, but a very quick test right in the system is very useful. We also have time series uh, uh, projection um, based on these. that same set. We can look at uh, the variation of diptera, hymenoptera, lepidoptera uh, across the season. Import, one important thing is you can search all these, all these uh, runs in, in the database when they're made public. Uh, okay, I will take just one minute to address this before he pulls out the hook. Um, hardware is really important. A lot of the hardware that runs both of these platforms is in the basement of this building in our 
uh, water-cooled data center. Um, we have about a thousand, a uh, little over a thousand cores, 200 terabytes of storage that we are extending, but we also have cloud computing provided by uh, a national agency of 600 uh, odd uh, cores um, with 100 terabytes of storage, plus we have elastic compute capability of 5,000 additional cores. It's not 50,000 cores, but uh, it's, uh, it serves our needs very well, especially as, as we expand. And we always have to ask the question with, compute, uh, with computation and databases, are we able to handle this uh, for eyeball squared, I guess? Um, 2.5 million species. So just a quick bit of math to determine if we're biting off more than we can chew. Uh, that turns into about, in the best case, 18.5 million specimens. Um, and as you work through the math, um, it ends up being 2,386 runs on a single SQL instrument. Now, in terms of computation, there are two components. One is a circular consensus that Evgeny talks, talked about. And each run, right now, costs about 512 CPU hours. One CPU running for 512 hours. Obviously, we parallelize this across multiple CPUs. So it turns into 50,000 CPU days to run the entire project. Um, and on Brave, on Embrave, it's actually much faster. It only takes about 24,000 uh, CPU hours uh, uh, to do this, or 1,000 CPU days. One CPU for 1,000 days, we're done. So uh, with our current capabilities, our current capabilities, uh, it would take 148 days if we dedicate our, our infrastructure to it, uh, and 238 terabytes of storage for the storage for the project. So um, the answer is no, we're not biting off more than we can chew. Uh, if plans go ahead, on the informatics side, this is a, a, a quite a solvable problem that, that we can deal with as we go. So I'll end on that. I'll thank all the people in there, and I'll rush off the stage. <laughs>